Hi, everyone. This is David Smith. You're watching No Kill in Motion. I'm here with Shirley Marsh from Yes Biscuit, Alan Rosenberg from New Jersey Animal Observer, and Aubrey Kavanaugh from No Kill Huntsville. Today, we're talking about transport. Um, Colorado, New Jersey, where Alan and I live, uh, have become target destinations for so many animals being transported, particularly from the South. Um, and you know, which should make us really close to being uh, no-kill states if uh, if we actually have that kind of room. There is a downside to transport, so I think we're going to talk about both sides today. Um, I'm going to come out and, and and tell you what's happening in Colorado very quickly. Uh, the last statewide statistics, which are um, uh, demanded by the state, um, actually show that we brought in over 50,000 cats and dogs into Colorado in 2020. Um, that's great. That's great that we're helping our neighbors, but we're still killing thousands of healthy and treatable pets in our shelter system. Now, um, you know, people say, well, why are those other cats not as important as the ones locally? And it's not that it's, they're not. Every individual life is equally important, but um, we could actually be no kill overnight in Colorado because I can tell you we have to save 10% of that number of those, those out of state transports to be a no kill state pretty much overnight. So we could still help our neighbors to the tune of 40 to 45,000 animals a year if we saved every healthy or treatable pet in our own shelter system. Um, so there's really no excuse in my mind of how we do that. And we should always help our neighbors, but I think we should always start locally first. You start in your own town, at the shelter down the block, then your county of the shelter in the next city, and then other counties in your state, and then go out of, out of state. And Colorado clearly has that ability. We should transport because if we didn't transport, we would just be boosting the retail market. Um, that's Colorado. That's my view of it. I want to hear what the rest of you have to say. Since I'm talking about Colorado, I wanted to say it's incoming. Um, I want to talk to Aubrey first because your state is more of an outgoing state. So what do you we say? Are, we are what would be called a source location. Um, transport is a big deal in Alabama. Um, and a lot of people, just like you have people that think that spay and neuter is the solution to end shelter killing, there are a lot of people that see transports as the solution. I, there are countless rescue groups in our state that are shipping animals out to other places. And whenever I criticize this, um, the criticism gets flipped back on me as if I don't care enough, as if I think that those lives are, aren't important and they are. But I think it was Mike Fry, you guys might remember this. He wrote a blog years ago and I think it related to Huntsville and I think it was called Think Globally, Adopt Locally because he, he had the same opinion as you, David, that you need to start in your own backyard. So, um, but let's take the value of transports for starters. Every animal that leaves Alabama that's going to a rescue group or an adoptive home in another state, that's great. But I think that putting too much reliance on that doesn't do anything to affect change at the source location. So if our answer is always transport, 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 well, then it begs the question, well, what are you doing in your own area to place those animals locally or to stem the flow? Um, the president of our local spay and neuter clinic talked about it one time about you need to turn off the faucet. I mean, if the water's always running, you're always going to need to be filling it up with buckets and, and toting it away. Let's turn off the flow. So I think that to the extent that you want to transport individual animals, like maybe there's an adopter in New Hampshire that finds a dog on Pet Finder that's in Birmingham and they just love that animal and they they're gonna have that individual animal transported. To me, that's different than these mass transports. And I think we need to be doing more at the source location. What are we doing to adopt those animals out locally? What are we doing to encourage uh, high volume, low cost spay and neuter to keep a lot of animals from being born? Because I think if you don't do anything at the source location, the flow is just gonna continue. And I know in our state that when the, when the pandemic was at its height, and I know we're still in a pandemic, a lot of these rescue groups were shut off from transport. They couldn't transport at all. And people were, they were freaking out because they had no, they had no target location for their animals. Now, I think that's changed and the transports have picked back up. I just think that you need to think of it in your own backyard. I don't want Alabama to be a source location for animals in New Jersey. I want Alabama to change so that we don't need to keep sending so many animals to New Jersey. 
All right, Alan, I'm going to go back to a, a intake location. What, what are you seeing in New Jersey? What do you think? So um, I see arguments both ways. So um, in New Jersey, make no mistake, we're still killing healthy and treatable animals. Um, 2019, which was the last normal year for animal shelter intake pre-pandemic, uh, we needlessly killed around 6,500 cats and around 1,000 dogs in the state. Um, but on the other hand, our shelters have the capacity from a supply and demand perspective to bring in a lot more animals. So if our shelters used all their physical capacity as well as their ability to access foster homes in their communities uh, and performed as well as well-run no-kill animal control shelters, they could adopt out, um, they could actually make not only New Jersey no-kill, but New York City, Philadelphia no-kill, and also um, wow. rescue and adopt out 25,000 more cats and 11,000 more dogs. Wait, wait, I, 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 gotta, I, I gotta stop you and ask you a question. When you say New York and Philly, do you just mean those large municipal shelters that we always hear about? Or do you mean the states? The cities. Okay. All right. That's still huge. I just want to make sure I understand. Yeah. I mean, because like, you know, the, the gap to get those places to like a 95% dog save rate and 90, 92, 90% right. cat save rate um, is, is not as large, not that large. So they could easily do that. Um, but the problem is a lot of New Jersey shelters, of course, are not progressive. So you have a lot of local shelters that really do, to, to put it bluntly, half-assed attempts at adopting out animals, meaning the customer service is poor, their adoption hours are really bad, especially now with the pandemic. So it's hard to adopt an animal. So when those, so those animals already have a tough time. Then you start bringing in all these transports for like easy to adopt puppies and people who may have went through the hoops and hurdles to adopt out those at-risk dogs in local municipal shelters will just say, hey, I'm going to go with that that easy to adopt puppy I saw at an adoption event in the park or whatever. So my view is the rescues should be focusing on saving the healthy, the, the treatable animals and healthy animals from those shelters before they start rescuing uh, animals from out of state. And the other thing as David touched upon, I agree, you should be working uh, outward from your geographic area because the goal of rescue should, whether it's transport or, or regular rescue, is to help uh, a, a kill shelter ultimately become a sustainable no-kill animal control shelter. That means fully adopting the no-kill equation programs. So yes, you can start transporting animals as the shelter is developing those no-kill equation programs, but you also need to have that physical, personal interaction to help the shelter develop the programs. So if you're close by, you can do that. But if you're hundreds or even thousands of miles away, that's not happening. And you're just operating a pet store. And the reason these shelters are doing the mass transports is twofold. Yes, they're adopting out the animals at a high fee, i.e. the pet store business model, but they're also using them as lucrative fundraising opportunities. And a lot of these shelters that do that, they're, it's, it's preventing them from actually implementing good no-kill equation programs because the animals adopt them themselves out. So it's, it's not good. It's not good because it doesn't encourage innovation and it doesn't encourage shelters to adopt the innovative no-kill equation programs to make a sustainable no-kill nation. Okay, I'm going to throw one thing out before I get to you, Shirley. One of the things that really frustrate me in Colorado is when I see a tax-funded shelter importing from out of state. I get very, very frustrated with that, even if it's a small amount. And uh, but one shelter, I'm not going to name the shelter here. Um, one shelter was, was uh, uh, pretty much uh, annually bringing in 30 percent of its dogs from out of state. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just. I, yeah. Uh, well, I'll talk about that on another one sometime. Surely I want to hear what you have to say on this. You're another source location. What are you seeing? Uh, same thing as as Aubrey. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of transports going out of South Carolina, but basically no fixes. In fact, recently a group called uh, No Kill South Carolina issued a statewide uh, plea saying that we're in a crisis situation. You know, in the state, we need people to adopt and such. Um, 
you know, we're transporting out, but we're not fixing anything. And, you know, we've talked about previously, uh, some people are attracted to rescue because they want to do that hands-on sort of heroic type work. Um, but it takes a lot of administrative uh, work and, and sort of nuts and bolts work to um, get to no kill. And instead of fundraising for transports, uh, why not fundraise for spay neuter clinics at these some of these source locations so that people who want to spay and neuter their pets can get in uh, within a, a reasonable period of time and not be put on a, an eight month or longer waiting list. You know, um, it, it doesn't, uh, the transports are good in that they are uh, saving lives, but they are, um, they are not addressing the problems. Yeah, they, they, you know, I think we all agree that uh, transport is something you do symptomatic uh, to, to address symptomatic issues. Um, and hopefully for a short period of time while you do the whole thing, I am thinking, I'm going to close with this. I remember that Houston, the city, uh, to go back to what you said, Shirley, literally uh, put hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars into a transport group mm -hmm. um, to get animals out of the city. And they do that every year. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm like, that's insane. Like, why aren't you putting in an adoption program, a foster program, spay neuter, free spay neuter clinics, especially, um, uh, you know, the whole no kill equation. Why not take that money and do that? Um, but we're out of time. We have to go. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm here with Alan Rosenberg from the New Jersey Animal Observer, Aubrey Cavanaugh from No Kill Huntsville, Shirley Marsh from Yes Biscuit. I'm David Smith from No Kill Colorado. We will see you next time.